to Enter VR. You are now listening to the podcast where we talk about all things virtual reality. I am your host, Chris Miranda, and on today's show, I am joined by Philip Rosedale, the creator of Second Life, and the uh, he's currently working on something really big, I believe. Uh, it's called HighFidelity.io, and uh, Philip, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Chris. This is this is super exciting because I am uh, I'm just a, a small guy uh, running a podcast and all of a sudden I'm interviewing uh, one of the people that I've uh, I, I've played Second Life when I was in college and I've I thoroughly enjoyed it so I gotta thank you for 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 putting that out there into the world. Great, you're welcome. So what are you working on these days? What is uh, HighFidelity.io? High Fidelity is uh, an attempt to create uh, a new uh, kind of virtual world software, basically a, a protocol and a, a bunch of software to enable uh, the creation of a large number of interconnected virtual worlds. And we're doing a couple of things different, and that are, you know that I think people would find to be different and interesting. Um, one of them is using sensors and devices like the Oculus and motion controllers like the Razer Hydra to uh, project you onto your avatar in a much more lifelike and you know emotionally compelling way when you're talking to someone. The second thing is we're building an infrastructure that not only allows the creation of standalone virtual worlds that are then interconnected, but also allows people to share their computers as uh, servers and devices in the virtual world so that the virtual world can be comprised of millions and millions of contributed devices and computers uh, rather than you know thousands of server machines. When you when you say the virtual world, what what is it uh, that you envision? Well, to me, a virtual world is a world that you know, like the real world, have the, has the properties that we are all in it together. It's it's collaborative, and you can create things inside the world, and you can communicate with each other. You know those those basic properties of the real world. Uh, you know the fact that we can change it, we can make things within it, and we can communicate with each other. Um, you know, I think those are the basic properties that virtual worlds have as well, and that virtual reality, um, as the kind of most immersive sense of that, is going to offer to all of us. And, and so, when when off when talking about HighFidelity.io, and you, one of the things that's setting setting it apart is the fact that you're going to be able to motion capture or capture facial expressions. Um, I'm also aware that you are planning on uh, incorporating Oculus Rift support. How would that how would that work? Being able to have motion cam motion sensing cameras capture your your facial expressions while you have a headset over your eyes? How would that? How do you think we can get over well, that? Well, we're actually doing right right now right now the software High Fidelity um, it does either or. So we've used the Oculus. We've we've been operational on the Oculus from the beginning. Uh, if, you know, if you plug in your Oculus and run the, the, the client at, at high fidelity or you, at this point you have still have to build it you know we're quite early in the process but uh, it, it just runs you know out of the box in the oculus if you've got the SDK installed the um, uh, the experience of using the oculus obviously allows your avatars head rotation you know to be exactly consistent with your own which is which is actually still very compelling you know nodding at each other for example when it's done with low latency is one of the very powerful ways that we communicate it's one of the things that you can't see so well sometimes in a video conference and if you induce a bunch of latency into that that you know that kind of nodding that you do when you're agreeing with someone if you introduce a bunch of latency into the, the a bunch of delay into the connection between two people they stop having an emotionally real uh, connection with each other. And so this is one of the things that uh, was our first concern to fix. Now, facial expressions like the movement of your eyes, eyebrows, and mouth um, are not capturable yet while you're wearing an Oculus, but there's lots of people thinking about how to do that. And in fact, um, an, a head-mounted display like the Oculus provides uh, an optimal way to uh, capture the motion of the face because obviously you could potentially put the device like a camera that's watching the face on the Oculus itself, which would be um, a really uh, a, a much more accurate uh, and realistic way of capturing uh, facial movements because when you do it with a camera, which we also do, we, we, we also allow you with high fidelity to use either the 2D camera in your laptop or uh, a 3D camera like the Prime Sense. Uh, slash, you know, connect uh, with those cameras. You you can you know you you find the person's face basically in the software, and then you extract these facial expressions, and that's a been a big part of our work. But uh, with the 
Oculus, you can get the motion of the head, but yes, you can't get the motion of the eyes and mouth. But our suspicion is that whether it's us or somebody else, this will this will get fixed uh, soon. Definitely. When all is said and done, what sorts of features should uh, consumers and enthusiasts expect out of uh, high fidelity? Well, um, just like we did with Second Life, we're looking at how to as you know as as quickly and completely as possible allow people to build interesting things. So, for example, you know we're building a very rich. Uh, interactive object model and, in fact, UI extensions and things like that around JavaScript. So uh, you can use JavaScript to, you know, program a, a pet or move the joints of an avatar or uh, uh, actually change your UI. So you, you know, you can we, we view the we view the interactive client that you're looking into the virtual world with as being a kind of a blank canvas that you should be able to attach programmable objects to that can actually render things on the screen and change the UI. And so that's the, one of the directions we're going in. So with high fidelity, what you can expect is a very low latency, very fast, you know, kind of gaming speed uh, ability to create interactive content. So whether that's, a, you know, a pet or a gun or, uh, you know, uh, you know, something else that extends the behavior of your avatar or trees growing in a forest, you know, all of those are things that we're very focused on uh, enabling people to build um, as quickly as possible. And we've made pretty good progress on that. We're certainly not, you know, at a launch point yet, but the because we're developing the software in open source, uh, it is available now for people to play with a little bit. And we've got a bunch of uh, we've we've got a number of Oculus users that have shown up in there already, and we're hoping to do some, uh, you know, fun things like get everybody that has an Oculus to get together and, you know, play and build and hang out uh, in the emerging space. Super cool. What is so then? You know, when this gets released, I will I should be able just like Second Life be able to explore and create worlds. Um, what. I've heard mentions at your Silicon Valley virtual reality meetup uh, talk where you were talking about incorpor incorporating cryptocurrency. Is this still something that uh, can be talked about a little bit? Sure. I mean, we're not exactly sure what we'll do there yet. And frankly, we're still learning everything about cryptocurrencies because they're a brand new idea and a really good idea. I mean, the, the fundamental idea behind a cryptocurrency is the idea that you can recognize a fact like the fact that somebody has an amount of money or that they just gave an amount of money to somebody else or something like the fact that somebody owns a certain object, for example. Um, and these things can be represent, you know, these things can be essentially recognized in, in what, what, and I don't mean to be pedantic for those who know about cryptocurrency, but what, what is called the blockchain, you know, you essentially can represent a sequence of events over all time that collectively comprise a kind of a ledger or a set of facts about the world. And you can represent that in the blockchain, meaning that you can uh, sort of have everyone uh, collectively agree on and manage a copy of that that chain of events. And so uh, if you apply that to something like high fidelity, the, the place where it has most relevance for us is that we're building a system that allows people to use uh, in a cloud-like, uh, peer-like fashion to use their devices to help each other out with scaling these virtual worlds. And so what you want is some kind of a currency of exchange or something that allows you to establish, uh, uh, it allows you to basically allow people to sort of pay each other or recognize each other for their computation time. So this is what we're thinking about. Still fairly early in that. Um, I uh, uh, haven't uh, written any of the back-end code around the actual management of a particular cryptocurrency yet, but... Uh, yeah. Truly, but that that's the direction we're thinking. And, and truly, I think it's a fascinating uh, aspect of, of high fidelity. Are, are you planning on adopting a pre-existing currency like a Dogecoin or a Bitcoin, or are you going to create your own from the ground up? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think it's more likely that we'd think about creating our own. You know, the experience with Second Life and the Linden Dollar, I would say that we have, we and Second Life as well, have more experience than anybody in the world on the properties and the, the real life problems associated with alternative currencies. Um, you know, the Linden Dollar, which has been extraordinarily successful, Second Life today has a gross domestic product uh, of something, or I, I don't know the exact number, but I think I think it's around 650. Uh, I think it's actually higher than this. It was like 650 million dollars U.S. Right. in exchanges between people in the virtual world every year, and the Linden dollar is much more stable against the U.S. dollar than, for example, the Bitcoin Whoa. is today. And the reason for that has to do with how the currency is managed. 
uh, of course, and and you know, uh, uh, Bitcoin has a particular management strategy, uh, and of course, a, 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 an alternative currency, a generalized currency, like as you mentioned, you know, like a Dogecoin or something like that, can be can actually have the settings done differently. It can be managed in a different way. Mm-hmm. So, we are thinking about how you'd ideally sort of set the settings for something that would work for virtual world and for sharing devices. And so that's something we're still pondering. So I'm not sure. Well, no worries. Are you anticipating that people are going to be able to uh, make a living inside of uh, high fidelity? Is this, is this, you know, where we're headed with the cryptocurrency and, uh, you know, because I think that, that virtual reality, just getting it out of the way, is, is, is not just going to be become an industry. I think it's going to become an economy in and out of itself. And I figured you building or helping build the, the metaverse, it, it feels like it's uh, it's heading in that direction. But what do you anticipate people will do? Absolutely. I, I, yeah, I mean, many people are able to make a living today in Second Life, uh, creating and, and, and mostly creating and selling digital goods. And uh, my my hope is that as these this new wave of devices like the Oculus make virtual reality both way more compelling and also way easier to get into, it just means that the uh, size of the number of people in the virtual world will scale up. Uh, you know, Second Life today is around a million people generating that 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 six hundred fifty million dollar GDP. So, you know, if you scale that up to closer to consumer internet size, which is like a billion or three orders of magnitude larger, I would expect that the economy will grow um, in the same way. So, you know, we, we we'd see a you know we'd see a much larger you know we'd, we'd see an economy closer to a trillion dollars in. Um, in exchanges, and that means lots of people can make a living there. Yeah, that, yeah, that's that sounds insane. It's just the numbers. It, what is your uh, what is your take on virtual reality? I mean, what is your overall uh, influences? What, you know, what is your take on the technology right now? Where it's going? All that good stuff. Well, you know, I we've been driven. Well, say influences. Like I, I obviously was a as someone who's been passionate about virtual reality pretty much my whole life. Um, uh, you know, Snow Crash was a, a delightful influence. Yeah, you know, I read that before, uh, you know, starting Second Life, and, and, and I found that to be a kind of a wonderful technical reference manual on many of the problems we'd later encounter building Second Life. And I think Ready Player One is, of course, the book in the last couple of years that's been so delightful to read. It's kind of a similar operations manual for building a virtual world. And so, you know, we've really enjoyed that here. Um, I think that... Uh, you know, in terms of other references, the the thing that that the thing that caused uh, my co-founders and I to start High Fidelity when we did was the same thing that really got the Oculus started, which was these gyros. You know, the the, the fact that you had these little tiny chips that could so accurately detect the rotation of, say, your head if they were attached to your head or or your hand. Uh, the, the, the fact that these chips are so cheap and so easy to use and so easy to connect in a low latency fashion to a PC means that meant, meant to me when I first saw it that, you know, we would be able to kind of get beyond the two degrees of freedom of the mouse. Yeah. And I think looking back on Second Life now, the, the biggest thing that has that has kept uh, it from growing bigger is simply that mouse um, using a mouse and a keyboard to manipulate and navigate things in a three-dimensional world is really, really difficult. It can be done well if you've got the time to commit to really learning how to do it, but it's a lot of time. And so people that are sort of casually interested in wandering around a virtual world have not been able to do it because you have to go through a learning process that's like 10 hours long. And so, you know, just exploring a virtual world in the same way that you explore a website is something that you cannot do. Uh, I mean, there's just, you know, there's no way you can make that time commitment to just look around. Now, if you're trying to make a bunch of money or, you know, be a part of a community in a really deep way, then yes, you can take the time. So I think that's what's limited the growth. I often say that uh, uh, in the same way that uh, virtual reality hasn't, you know, grown past that million person mark yet, in a similar way, neither has AutoCAD, Hmm. neither has Maya. Hmm. There aren't a million people using so a product like Maya, but there should be, of course. It's amazing, right? I mm-hmm. mean, you can create the most incredible three-dimensional objects, you know, beautiful ones, uh, and yet we don't have 
uh, millions of people using Maya. And of course, there's a free version, you know, called Blender. And we don't have millions of people using that. And the reason for that is that it's way too hard with a mouse. Mm -hmm. But I think that with these devices that are coming, driven by the gyro and many other, you know, small electronic components, we're just we're just going to suddenly make it possible for uh, somebody to sort of get started and start building things and start interacting with a virtual world um, using things attached to their head and their hands. What do you think is the ideal uh, input device for the casual user then? Is it the glove? Is it is it the armband that tracks your muscle movements? What do you What's your take on that? Well, we have got and have played with, uh, well, I'm not going to say every single one of those devices in the world, but <laughs> pretty close. <laughs> We've got them all. And uh, I think they're all great. I mean, there's a lot of fascinating exploration being done. I'd, I'd say I'm not entirely sure. I love the idea of a wireless device sewn into your clothes that can detect your upper body and skeletal, you know, arm movements. <laughs> I think that's a really exciting direction that somebody's going to get right. Uh, there's no there's no product coming out yet that that does exactly that, but there are a couple of you know Kickstarters that are coming out that are pretty darn close. Mm. Things like uh, the Six Sense uh, STEM product, um, and you know there's there's an earlier earlier in stage product that's called the Prio uh, Prio VR that that's interesting as well. So I think that one way or another we're going to have motion controllers that track our hands and our arms effectively you know talking with your upper body and your arms and hands is a very powerful way of communicating and um we're doing it here you know obviously with all this cobbled together hardware um and it's amazing and so i think that we will get consumer versions of that out there and people will be blown away by how fun it is to just communicate normally basically definitely you know i've read uh masters of doom and and i've seen a few interviews where uh with, with palmer lucky and one of the things that keeps uh that gets stuck in my mind is this idea that john carmack is thinks that it is morally imperative that we build the metaverse and 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 You'll see interviews where Palmer Lucky will bring that up. How it is morally imperative that we bring out the we, we build the metaverse. Do you think it's morally imperative that we? And, and what does that mean? Uh, that's the question that I've always wanted to like figure out. Someone in Oculus ask, but but for you, someone who's so far ahead of the pack, what you know in, in terms of creating and developing this technology, what do you do? You think it's morally imperative, and and if so, what what does that mean? <laughs> That's a great question. I, I myself haven't used that expression, but I have heard it used. Um, I do think that there. I'll, I'll, my explanation of why I think that has merit, why, why I think there is a uh, a great force for good in, in bringing VR online, is simply the fact that if you look at Second Life and you look at its effect on people, its overall effect on people's lives has been very inspirational. It has created jobs. It has helped with uh, psychological problems. It has. Uh, enabled cross-culture relationships to be built. It's enabled human, you know, one-on-one -on -one relationships to be built with people that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So I think when, when John Carmack and, and Palmer Lucky say morally imperative, I think they're right. And I, and I think that the evidence is there in Second Life, which is that overall, by and large, and in, in many ways to an extent, to an extent greater than or, or transcendent to the real world, the, um, these, that the, these virtual worlds are, are, are better and great for people. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, I know that I, I wouldn't say imp imperative is a strong word, but I know that what keeps me getting out of bed in the morning and never stopping working on this, you know, uh, at a point where I certainly could, you know, I, I guess I could sort of stick a fork in it and say I'd had a pretty good career already, but, uh, I will never stop working on this because, uh, I want to see a billion people, in a virtual world and i think that yeah that virtual world will be it, it won't be some you know ominous dystopian thing it'll be this incredibly empowering delightful thing that that uh in the in, in insofar as it exists in second life has been unbelievable to watch and enjoy mm -hmm. and, and yeah i've i realized that this is uh something that is incoming and it is n unstoppable <laughs> in my opinion um especially with the with the whole the facebook acquisition did that segment uh, already what was in your mind a valid um uh, path for the future when that acquisition happened i i think the acquisition was just great i mean i think that it validates how exciting a space this is mm -hmm. i think that uh, uh a company as big and as smart as facebook saying we 
so fundamentally believe in the possibility here that we're just going to go ahead and buy this company mm -hmm. is just super inspiring. I mean, it's just incredibly inspiring. I'm, I'm, uh, I would, you know, when I got up in the morning and saw that happen, I just, you know, wanted to cheer and say, well, you know, this is all going to happen now even faster. Indeed. What does this mean for, I mean, when you, when you talk about having a billion people inside the metaverse, what does this mean for privacy? Is, is, is privacy in the 21st century an evolving animal that we were going to have to just sort of adapt to? Um, because I, I, I know that, you know, governments will want to, and, and, and marketers will want to see everything I see. Um, and, and it, that's kind of creepy to me. What, what, what's your take on, on, on privacy? Inside well, the first of all, the, the, the correct and only architecture for, a vir for virtual worlds long term will be similar to the architecture we see today with SSL and with uh, OpenID. Mm -hmm. That is to say, we will decide how we disclose identity to the sites we visit and, and, and now imagine that the word site is replaced with virtual world. So when I come to your virtual world, I will decide what information – I want to give you and you'll decide what information I need to give you. So you may not let me in if I don't authenticate at some level, but it'll certainly be the case that we'll have a choice over that. And it won't be the case that we would use a single sort of a name floating over our heads in the virtual world. And this is a subtle but important point. Uh, you know, we won't um, present ourselves in the way we do on Google Plus or Facebook or, uh, or a kind of explicit, uh, simplistically named account style site. Um, the reason why we won't do that is because the disclosure of identity in the real world is an important part of human transactions. You, you, you greet people and you decide to tell them your name, then you decide to tell them where you work, then you decide to tell them where you live. And this decision has to be up to you. And the virtual world will be exactly the same way. It, it would be it would be completely illogical to suggest that it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. That said, we are all moving into an era in which the average amount of privacy is less than it was before. And I think that's an important point that people have important conversations about. Um, we, As you said, we are all going to live in an era, and virtual worlds are no different in this regard, where we are all entering into an era in which there is less privacy. We are, On average, we are more likely to know things about each other than ever before. Yeah, which is weird, but I guess I'll have to roll with it. <laughs> what is? I, yeah, it's you don't get a choice. It's, <laughs> it's just not something we're going to be able to choose. But we are going to be able to choose. But, but I do, do not think that virtual worlds will worsen this problem. Um, mm -hmm. They will simply be environments in which, appropriately designed, which is what we're working on, you will you will disclose the aspects of identity that are appropriate to the person you need to disclose them to. Very cool. Oh, what uh, in terms of design? What other uh, design aspects in terms of like, uh, is there going to be gameplay features? Are people going to be able to be able to design games, it, just, not just worlds, but like perhaps you know throw in like a specific environments with 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 different you know control sets so that people can you know for example visit my virtual bar where there's going to be a shootout every uh, Wednesday at 6 p.m. and you can be part of it. I mean, is that something that people can all, can build with? Will be able to build with sure. high fidelity? Yeah. Well, the two things that enable that fundamentally are the delay in the system, so the latency in different system components. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if I you know if I shoot at you, and the bullet you know this is just like with a first person shooter game. You know, if the if the bullet uh, if the timing of the bullet and you are not uh, fast enough. It's not satisfying to play. It, you, you end up with a situation where kind of somebody's cheating or it's just not fun or whatever. Mm -hmm. So latency is one key constraint around whether you can build game-like features into virtual worlds. The second is uh, visual detail. You know, um, people have come to expect the environments that you see in the most awesome, you know, game engines today. You know, things like uh, Unity and CryEngine and Unreal and uh, so what this means is that in the virtual world, people are going to want to create environments that are um, as as compelling looking as they see in those other engines. And you know, certainly in our design with high fidelity, we are uh, contemplating that. And our belief is that yes, you you should be able to do anything in the virtual world uh, visually and with respect to latency that you can do in a game. And that means that people will be able to build these games inside these worlds. Now, mm -hmm. 
the gaming industry has always done a great job of exploiting the newest technology absolutely to its limits to create an amazing experience. And my suspicion is that there will always be kind of purposeful, purposefully built game experiences that are incredibly compelling and realistic. And they'll kind of be the leaders that teach us, uh, you know, what to do next in the virtual world. And so I, I bet they'll, I bet the games will always be out there on the edge. I also think that when the Oculus comes out, we are initially going to just play games with it. I mean, it's just, it's just going to be so incredible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I've been down there and have had the demo of the, uh, you know, the, the DK2 uh, Oculus and it's just mind bogglingly great. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. Indeed. In terms of, you know, I, human beings, we're cousins, or one of our closest cousins is the bonobos, and, and, and it's for a reason. We're, we're sexual animals, and we're going to, I feel like we're going to use that, take that sexual energy into this, uh, you know, the virtual world. How do you, how will high fidelity accommodate two consenting adults wanting to have virtual reality cyber sex? Um, and, and, and what do you think that's going to look like? Well, it, where I'm heading is, do you think that we're going to have virtual reality prostitution in, in, inside of these virtual metaverses? I, I don't know. I mean, I think that as a human culture, we've, we've, we explore every avenue we possibly can. And, and, and you're right. You know, we're certainly emotional and sexual and, uh, you know, uh, we love to communicate, and so I, I think people will use every tech, every new technology they can absolutely to its limits in that regard. You know, uh, we, we saw that in Second Life, and I'm, I'm sure we'll see it in High Fidelity. And I think that if you, uh, well, I guess if you designed virtual worlds in such a way that they explicitly didn't allow people to do things like that, they wouldn't succeed. So, yeah. uh, you know, but but as to the details of it, I don't know. You know, the the, the human experience of, of being sort of face to face with another person, mm -hmm. no matter what you're doing, is extremely nuanced. Uh, one of the things we've, I think, become experts on, and, and I would say it's a deep and difficult space, is kind of what happens in the brain when you're face to face with someone else. Uh, we've been we've been doing some research. Uh, uh, I've been doing some research work uh, with a friend of mine who's a noted uh, neuroscientist named Adam Ghazali, and we've been working together on how we can use things like MRI to look at the nature of the face-to-face -face experience and maybe learn something about what happens when you're you know, really looking at another person, for example, and, and to what extent we can capture that in virtual reality. And this stuff is difficult. Um, you know, reaching out and touching another person, for example, is something that we're working on right now, you know, the sort of physics of touch. And mm -hmm. it's an extremely complex thing, you know, that's very demanding of accuracy and latency and, you know, visual realism and I, all this stuff. And I, and I would say that it's, uh, there's going to be a lot of interesting work done to support it. But uh, I think that we'll, we'll use the medium however it can be used. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't hazard a guess yet as to what exactly that will be. I'd say it's complicated. Yeah. Just the last couple of questions. I know you're, you're super busy. What, yep. um, number one, what is, what do you think, what do you think is going to be, um, oh my God, I just had it. Oh my God. I just had it in the tip of my tongue. Oh, what do you think is going to be the, the biggest, I mean, now that Facebook and this thing is just unraveling and, and starting the snowball, do you think there are any obstacles to virtual reality as we speak or going forward into the future, whether it be a Congress that is scared of technology or a public that doesn't understand it. What do you think is going to be the uh, biggest obstacle now? Well, I, I think virtual reality has a nice uh, gradual nature to it. So I don't think it'll be that threatening to people to mm. see virtual worlds emerge as spaces because they so often are a sort of a, <coughs> excuse me, positive utility for people. You know, it, it, for example, it would let you, you know, seek out a job with more people than you could normally. I don't, I think that we've got so much sort of world flattening going on around us culturally in so many different great ways that I, I think virtual reality will just be yet another one of those things. So I don't, I don't know what will frighten people about virtual worlds as they begin to be deployed more generally. I think most of us will just see it as, interesting you know everybody will want to check out the you know the latest you know virtual version of xyz mm -hmm. 
last last question coming to a close what is your ultimate vision of of the future with virtual reality where does virtual re reality lie in and i know this is a, a a fool's errand sort of question where you're trying to predict the future but where does virtual reality lie with in the in our future with in conjunction with 3d printing in conjunction with uh i don't know quantum computers or, or bioengineering all that good stuff where does vr stand or where will it stand well, I, I think probably two of the most important and uncertain areas of technology development that are critical right now, and, and lots of other great thinkers have, have, have identified this as well, but I think that artificial intelligence and virtual reality are two very important spaces where a lot of change is going to be created by them, and we're not really exactly sure what the nature of that change will be. I think specifically for VR, I think we're very likely to see aspects of business travel, of education, uh, and of like design and collaboration, very significant aspects of those things moving into the virtual environment. And as that happens, it will have substantial repercussions for, you know, life as we know it. Um, you know, if we no longer uh, engage or need to engage nearly as much in business travel, for example, this will be an enormous change in the many economic systems, uh, the, the sort of geopolitics of, you know, where the center is with respect to say design or finance or whatever. Uh, these are big changes. Uh, ditto with education, you know, ready player one, uh, alluded to this, uh, in a fictional form. And I think it's very correct. That is, you know, why would we with sufficiently good VR technology, why would we gather, uh, in classrooms? You know, we've already seen great work toward this with, uh, you know, you know, sites like uh, Coursera and Udacity, where we're starting to teach people online, but virtual reality will allow, enable us to teach people in exactly the same ways that we've historically taught them. Mm -hmm. And the, the, but, but of course, at much less cost in terms of travel and getting together and and and, and reaching out to a larger and larger you know classroom. So that is going to be an enormous change. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, I think just you know, just business travel and education alone are two areas that uh, virtual reality will almost certainly have a huge, uh, you know, worldwide impact on. Yeah, the airline industry is going to have a, a bad day when that rolls around. So, so Philip Rosedale, how can people uh, stay in touch? How can people follow what High Fidelity and you are you are doing? Uh, you know, when how can they support all that all that good stuff? Well, HighFidelity.io is our website, and there's a lot of good resources there. There's a sign up for our alpha program which we're starting to let people into. Uh, you got to give us time. We're, we're just barely getting things working, but we are starting to let a few people into that. There's a sign-up form on the site for that. Um, it also There's also a link to uh, something called the Worklist. Uh, the Worklist is a, actually a paid contribution site that allows part-time contributors to actually help us out um, on the software here. Uh, and the code itself is on GitHub, and there's a link at highfidelity.io to that as well. Um, and so if you are an intrepid, uh, brave uh, developer, you can actually build our stuff today and uh, give it a try and, you know, may maybe even catch us and have a chat with us uh, in world using the technology. That uh, sounds amazing. Um, once again, you have been a scholar, a true scholar and gentleman of virtual reality. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time, Philip. Great. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Chris.